Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome back to the VSI webinar series. Today, we're going to be speaking to Malky Mackay, Performance Director at the Scottish Yay. FA. Dr Ian Lawrence, who you're all familiar with, will be in hot debate with uh, Malky uh, across multiple areas of his career. But before we dive into the questions, um, we are going to hand over to Tim Coates, who will explain how you can answer questions through the chat box. And then at the end, we will uh, we'll go through the questions that you put forward to us. Tim. Cheers, Tony. So as always, if you're watching this on YouTube, um, you can't ask any questions because they won't come through. If you're lucky enough to be a participant on this webinar, of which there are quite a few, then um, just type the questions that you've got in the chat box. Time permitting, we will pick up with it at the end and ask the best ones, one or two. So without further ado, um, straight over to you, the maestro himself, who's sat in his uh, new ambiance. Um, away you go, Ian. Looking forward to this one. Cheers, Tim. Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, really looking forward to having Malky as our guest today. Uh, Malky's playing career as a centre-back has taken him from a part-time contract at Queen's Park in Glasgow to representing his country. In between, Malky's playing career has taken him to Celtic, south of the border to Norwich, West Ham and Watford. And it was at Watford where Malky got his first taste of club management before moving on to lead Cardiff City and Wigan Athletic. In December 2016, Malky was appointed the Scottish FA's Performance Director, a role in which he's responsible for overseeing the SFA's pipeline for elite player development. It's also a role which uh, led to him, uh, a period of him working as a caretaker manager for the men's national team. So maybe we'll get onto that a little bit later as well. But first things first, we just go through the chronology, Malky, in terms of your career. So you grew up in Belzil, Glasgow, uh, working part time in a bank. Um, was it always your ambition or do you re were you able to look into a crystal ball at that stage and see that at some stage you were going to go into coaching and management at the end of your playing career? Um, hi, Ian. and I think I suppose looking at that, the, the starting point of that, um, I was kind of obsessed with, with football since I was, you know, eight or nine years old. My dad was a uh, and a former player at Queen's Park in Glasgow um, and became a, a coach there and then was on the committee and became the chairman there. So um, he's been involved with that club for 50 odd years. Um, so I've been around the club since I was about 10 years old, was in their youth programme, um, but they're an amateur club. So at 16, when I finished school, uh, I went to work in a bank full time because um, I needed a full time job um, and played part time at night with Queen's Park. Um, got in the first team around about 18 and the obsession was always to try from Queen's Park it was seen as a feeder club for Scottish football that being the case um, you tried to to do well there to get a contract somewhere else and clubs could just come and take you like uh, they have with Andy Robertson Re more recently Andy started at Queen's Park and went on to Dundee United Hull and obviously Champions League player now with Liverpool so um, that's the way I started the route I started and the obsession was always yeah the Bank of Scotland was a day job uh, but the obsession with, with doing everything I could to try and become a professional footballer, even at the, the kind of ripe old age of 21 when I finally did leave to go to Celtic. What was it like signing for Celtic? Was, that must have been a big day in the, the Mackay household. It was strange because um, all through the summer, uh, there was St Mirren had been, had been kind of very interested in chasing me and finally put a contract down. Um, and kind of at the very last minute, Celtic asked me to come in and train with them. Um, which I did, um, and uh, finally had the conversation up in Liam Brady's office above the uh, reception where myself and the Queen's Park manager were asked to go in, and, um, and he offered us a contract there and then, go home and talk to your mum and dad about it. So the option was stay and, stay and become uh, working banking, uh, go to St Mirren or, uh, or go into Celtic. It wasn't quite as straightforward as that. I'd be getting into Celtic's reserves um, on, on a, a lowly contract, the St Mirren contract was to go in and become the Premier League captain of their club and, and, and quite a good, a reasonable salary, certainly double what Celtic were offering or stay in the bank. So that was the three options I had. Um, and I took, the, I took the route into Celtic's reserves. Uh, that's, that's the way we decided to go. Did you, were you ever uncertain that you were going to make it as a player? Because I guess for, for a lot of parents, when they've got a kid who's obviously got ability and has been courted by football teams and stuff, from a parental perspective, did they ever ever try and get you to balance this, you know, just in case the football career doesn't work out type analysis? 
I suppose staying on and doing my exams at school, uh, you know, I did my, my all levels, my hires, and and had started my banking exams was was certainly one way. I suppose the fact that I was I was kind of obsessed with trying to become a professional footballer, I could still, I suppose, at that point, then go back into the real world. Um, I think it probably helped me going in starting later and as a professional into into a football club. But 21, I had I had been working for five years in a 50 cents a bank and really had seen a lot of the, what, what you would class as the real world as opposed to the bubble of football. Um, so I think I went in with a little bit more maturity into Celtics reserves and still you, you've got no guarantees. And, and in fact, I tore my cruciate two years in. So, and had five managers in five years at Celtic. It was a very turbulent period. But at the same time, I think you, you've got to have that obsession and drive and determination. Did, did you ever during that, when you were a football player, did you ever see the managers that you're working with, the head coaches, and start to think, yeah, actually, if I move into a manager or career further down, like, when did those ideas first stop and into your, start appearing in your head that you actually fancied maybe doing this at the end of your playing career? It was interesting because the Queen's Park manager, a guy called Eddie Hunter, um, was, was obsessed with his players becoming full-time pros. And he, you really felt that he, he cared about you. And going into Celtic, um, the kind of shock that the manager really was looking after himself as well and, and his own career was in the professional game was I think something that, that hit me um, certainly one of the managers that, um, you know I worked for in my career I looked at and I thought I will never do what you do if I, if I become a manager and never treat players like that um, a variety of managers throughout the years where you look at them and you think there's, they've got good certainly really good traits and there's other there's other areas that maybe that they, they don't quite actually meet up the more and more managers you see um, and I suppose right to the very end where my last couple of managers were, were possibly two of the, the, the guys that I actually took most off, which was Eddie Boothroyd at Watford and Brendan Rodgers at Watford. What made those two guys special in terms of Eddie and Brendan? What made them stand out? I think, I think personality. I think the actual ability for them to make people feel wanted and feel special and feel as if that they were important. Basically, human needs. I think Eddie was fabulous around building a training ground, building a, uh, how, how the actual the place worked, how everyone knew their role and responsibility and how everybody felt as if he cared about them, both staff and players. Um, and, and consequently, Brendan came in after him. Brendan followed him after I, I was the interim manager, but Brendan followed him in. And Brendan was fabulous on the grass coaching-wise. And, and I took a lot from that. Um, but also, and he was only at walk for a short period of time. Uh, um, and it's, it's certainly over years been friendly with him that I actually go to the clubs and I see how uh, players buy into him because players actually feel as if he's desperately trying to improve them as footballers. And so I think I think the, the, the overriding factor of the, the personality of the leader um, at whatever club you're at, at whatever business you're in, um, plays a huge part on the, the shape of the culture of that organisation. And I wouldn't have thought that kind of personality and your own philosophy, those kind of personality skills, necessarily come from any kind of coaching education or the badges that you take with, with the governing body. How much of that do you think comes from your family, your background? Do you find that you, you share a lot in common in terms of the family backgrounds of these people that you admire? I think um, I think you look at people and you, you see the traits that come out in terms of work ethic, um, where, where they get that from. Is it, is it from a family member? Is it from the environment they've been brought up in? Is it from a mentor that they've had in their life? Um, and I think I think the, the value side of it, that that you know standards and disciplines and uh, where do you where do you get that from? Is it an old manager you got it from? Certainly in my career, early on in my career, the, the Queen's Park manager Eddie Hunter in the the early days, Frank Connor, the reserve manager at Celtic, they both would today be seen as very old school and very you know like dinosaurs, but they were actually they bred resilience in you at the time, and and if you were able to stand up to what they what they actually how they trained you. Um, certainly, looking back on it, there's people like that that you know that that's, those traits are still with you today in terms of that work ethic and discipline. Um, we recently had Paul Scholes and Dan Fletcher up on our master class, uh, the Scottish FA, and the the main which was about midfield master class. So it was all talking about the midfield play and to about 120, 130 coaches. And but one of the main traits that came through the whole day was the influence that Eric Harrison, the reserve manager, had on them. Um, and at times how hard he was in them, but the, what he drove into them in terms of work ethic and discipline and standards to actually uh, allow them to make that bridge, that gap, um, when they jumped into Sir Alex's team, who would be the exact same way with them. 
So I think it's it's a combination of factors when you see people who have been successful and are successful in certainly in the football world as to as to what it is that underpins them. I'm, I'm interested in actually how you made the transition from being a player one day where you're hanging out with friends and you're, you're socialising with them. And maybe in the afternoon when the decision gets made, suddenly you're a caretaker or an interim manager and suddenly the responsibilities change. Is that difficult to navigate that kind of change? It was really, it was really strange. And it, it came, I, I was at the back end of my career um, at Watford um, with, with Eddie Boothroyd. Um, and um, I remember he phoned me one evening uh, and I trained in the morning and he phoned me that night and, and said, I want to come and see you. And it was just myself, my wife and the baby. And she said, who on earth's phoning us at nine o'clock at night to come and see us? We've got a baby. I said, it's the manager. So the next minute she's hoovering the walls and making sure that the uh, the pillows are puffed up. And he came in and I had, I had no idea what he was coming in to, to say because I had seen him that day and I was going to be in training the following morning. And I was genuinely worried as to what, what this was going to be. And he came in and he, he wanted something to eat. He was hungry. So she's away making him something to eat. And I'm thinking, get on with it and tell me what it is you're going to say. And he said, I'm going to sack the assistant. I'm going to sack the first team coach tomorrow, and I'd like you to become the player coach. And it was, I was completely shocked. It was halfway through a season, and it was kind of wow. Um, think about it, uh, and phone me at seven a.m. because I'm going to, I'm going to, you know, do that at eight o'clock and at nine o'clock I'm going to announce it. So we kind of, I was a real shock to to do that to become the, the player coach from being the player. And consequentially, to go from being a first team coach to being a, an interim manager was a really interesting thing. I was I was AD's then first team coach eventually, and um, and I remember I was I was at the cinema one Sunday afternoon. I came out and there was first team missed calls from the chief executive uh, to phone him to get to the, the the office as soon as possible. And I got down there, and AD and the assistant manager had been sacked. Uh, we'd been going through a tough time, but you still don't think it's going to happen until it actually does happen. And he said, I need you to take the team for, for a few weeks until we decide on a new manager. Um, you know, so I did. Um, and we, we we won three, drew one, lost one, enjoyed it. Um, and, and it brought, you know, a variety of things with it that maybe you want to discuss. But certainly then a few weeks later, then um, they brought in an absolute nobody. I, I interviewed for the job as well, and it was between me and another guy. And he, they brought a nobody in who was the reserve manager at Chelsea at the time. Who knows who he was going to be? Uh, <laughs> and it ended up being Brendan. So, uh, you know, it, it's a, it was a strange time. What, what were the skills that AD saw in you initially and then ultimately the chief exec saw in you and saw the potential? What were the things that, that you stood out for? I suppose I suppose that the fact to that, that maybe the captaincy thing, whereas, you know, the, the uh, still obsessed with football at that point and, and, training as hard as I could in the latter parts of my career and being as fit as you can and being trying to, trying to be, um, I suppose, a good ambassador for whatever football club you're at and, and being the captain of, of, I suppose, most of the clubs and being vocal um, was something that, that maybe maybe the AD saw that he could he could mould. He was very good with people. Um, you know, he built a real good team of staff around about him. And at one point at Watford, AD had in the one room myself, Sean Dyche is a youth team manager, he had Mark Warburton, um, who's a manager as well. He was he was one of the one of the coaches, um, a guy called Richard Collins, who's the head of medicine at, at West Ham now. Martin Pert, who's was a sports scientist, who's now first team coach at Man United. Dick Bate, one of the best coach educators in Britain, was was part of the group as well. Um, I, I just think he, he knew how to get to bring people together who had potential that that he would then give a license to to actually grow. And I think that's a real good skill. It's something that I, I certainly try to take from him. But um, it was, as far as chief execs concerned, um, I suppose I'd been at the club for five or six years. I'd been an ambassador for the club. I'd played their coach there, and, and they gave me the chance to be the interim manager. Um, at that point, then it's a case of, well, how's he going to do? Uh, and I remember since then, a few years later, somebody said to me, I, I was there the, the night you had your first team talk to the staff. And the players, to, you know, did the first day, um, and it was he, the guy was in the dressing room uh, with me after we played Liverpool in the Carling Cup final against with, with Cardiff, and that night I had to give a speech to actually pick us back up again after being beaten in penalties, and we still had to try and go for for playoffs near the end of the season with Cardiff, and it was a reasonably good speech. The guy said, and he said, I remember the first speech you gave as an interim manager, 
and he said, and I thought at the time, great appointment, get him in, stable, good guy, captain of the club. And he said, and then, you, then you opened your mouth to the people and it was the worst speech I've ever heard in my life. Um, so I suppose you grow with things like that. But as far as interim managers concerned, I think there's a big there's a big difference between a coach and a manager. And I think um, when you get a chance to see that as the interim, you actually see all the things that the manager has to deal with that a coach doesn't. And they're, they're, they can be two vastly different careers. Can you elaborate on that then, Malky? So I guess... A lot of the coach education courses are providing with the technical skills, the analysis, the, the player welfare, the, the physiological, the sports science. A lot of the courses are oriented around that. But then as you move into a managerial role, and I guess it's changed over time as well, historically, from the manager being the, the focal point to the organisation to being a lot more um, diversity of roles now within, within an organisation. What, what would you say are the... the is the, the old-fashioned, the archetypal manager, is that role now dead within the football industry, within professional football? I don't think it's dead. I think it's, it's changing because I think a lot of clubs have gone down the European model of having the sporting director and a head coach. But even then, even then at the training ground, what you would now deem a head coach or a manager um, still has to deal with something vastly different than his coaches have to deal with. Um, the coaches really have got the, the, the good end of the stick. The, you know, they're, they're out on the grass every day with the players. They're not falling out with the players in general because they're not picking the team. Um, they've got the, they back the manager, obviously, and they, they, they say what, you know, what, what the party line is. But at the same time, they're there to improve and everything on the grass is enjoyable. Um, what they don't have is they don't pick the team. Um, the manager, on the other hand, once you do, I suppose, open Pandora's box and look inside and see what it is this job entails of being a manager, which is what I did when I was an interim, that you have to deal with the moans, the, the needs of the players, the needs of your staff, uh, the, you know, them coming to see you about a variety of different things that will get nothing to do with the game on a Saturday. Um, the board of directors come chief executive, come owner, you've got to deal with that. Um, the fans got in, you know in terms of communication how you communicate to the fans and also the press so you've got all these factors that have got that all want questions asked all want a PC all want decisions made by the manager that the coach never ever sees now if a coach opens that and looks at that and says I, I, I don't mind that I can embrace that then good all well and good and that's the line you should go down but they need to look at that and see that that's a massive part of the job. The bit on the grass really is, a, is unfortunately a tiny bit of, the, of the, the manager or the head coach's job nowadays. I'm interested in something that, that we've spoken about in the past where, where you brought up an example from Germany. And you were talking about the three things that you look for in, in a really skillful coach. And you mentioned, you can elaborate on this if you don't mind, about the ability to coach, be in love with the game and be a people catcher. Can you just elaborate about what, that, what that's about? Because a lot of people wouldn't have heard yeah. of those terms before. Sure. Um, I went over to Germany when I was out of work and I went over to the Bundesliga and I went to a couple of clubs and spoke to people from the, the FA as well. There's a great book, Das Reboot, which is how the, the Germans actually really changed their whole coach education structure after being being beaten badly in the in the qualifying rounds of the World Cup one year, about 10 to 12 years ago. Um, but then going on from that, you speak to them and, and one of the things that the, the head of coach education spoke to me about they call it, um, the German term is mentioned, Fanger, but it means people catcher. Um, and the, the three things they look for in, in a head coach or a, or a coach of, of a talent is does he have the ability to stand out on the pitch and take a training session, take a, a shape, actual session with a bag of balls, a group of players, and had 100 people watching him. So can he, can he coach under pressure? Um, is he obsessed with the game? Does he, is he, uh, you know, is there a lust for education? Does he want to know the, the finer details of the tactical aspects of the game, the current trends? Does he, you know, is he someone that, um, you know, is skilled in football? And the third thing, and the most important thing they spoke about was this sense of being a people catcher. Do you make players want to play for you? Do you make staff want to work for you? And it's personality. One of the biggest, you know, uh, I suppose exponents of that right now is Jurgen Klopp. They call Jurgen Klopp in Germany a people catcher. And I think it's a huge thing in our country in terms of young coaches. Do they want to, you know, bury their head in the, the tactical aspect of it? But you've got to get people to, to come with you as well. And certainly from my experiences um, around the world, trying to look for best practice here, and everywhere I go that I, that I see it exhumed, I, I see the, the guy at the top, the leader, having that sense of being a people catcher. A lot of people identify charisma as being the X factor, don't they, with the really elite, successful coaches and stuff. 
Mm. Is that something that you can learn on a course? Is that something that just comes from, from your background? Recognizing that you need to have charisma. How, how does it how does it get created? I think I think courses help. I think that uh, nowadays um, I think the the, the 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 want for education is is more and more, and I think more and more people realise that. Um, that because maybe of the variety and the the, um, the competition out there, I suppose for for courses means that that um, people are trying to put on better and better courses with more and more uh, people that sit in front of the the guest lecturers that come in that have got so many different strings to their bows and different uh, facets of industry or 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 the sport. And I think sitting in front of these people, when you hear about their the tales and you listen to them and you read their books and you 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 hear about best practice and you um you take as much as you can from them it, it can certainly help um and i think embracing opinion is certainly something that i keep preaching to our coaches embrace opinion listen to what other people have got to say one thing from what they say in that hour might be something you take away and you add to your own uh you know to your own strength to your own bow but certainly i think a combination of your family background the mentors that you have and these best practice um, guest speakers and where you educate yourself all come into it. But at the end of the day, I, I firmly believe if you don't have that, if you don't have that personality, um, then you're not going to get to that that real peak where people want to, to actually work for you. Burnout seems to be something which is which is common for executives in, in a variety of different high pressure, high profile industries. Do you think that owners, boards, uh, fans put too much pressure on managers and head coaches? Is, is it an unrealistic set of expectations in terms of the burden that these people have got to carry? Well, I think if you look at it from from a few years ago, um, we kind of laughed at Serie A because we looked at Serie A and we saw that Serie A had three managers in a year and or three head coaches in a year and how bonkers that actually was. And then within, a, you know, certainly in the last couple of years, that has come into Britain. Now, whether that's to do with um, the the media contracts, which make the, the how lucrative, certainly the English Premier League and the Championship actually are in terms of the, 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 the possibility of, of billionaire owners making huge amounts of money in the investment and individuals that own companies from all around the world now mean that um, the, the business model is looked on differently. So, you, so where a manager used to have a chief executive and then report to a local board of directors um, to maybe a, a chairman or an owner, well, that's, that, that model is gone with a lot of clubs at the moment and it really is a manager to possibly to a consultant who might be an agent um, into the ear of the owner uh, and the whims of, of, of an owner on the other side of the world. So the actual model has changed, but also I think the the, the media spotlight, the, the fact that the you know the EPL has grown, you know, in terms of the the the, uh, the worldwide aspect, it now means that there's a 24 news where uh, the judgment and the debates and social media and um, and everything else that goes with it means that the manager's under scrutiny 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And I think if you touch on businessmen who actually maybe have a quarterly report and report to an AGM once a year, um, the difference between that and, and a football manager being judged, I was going to say on a Saturday evening every seven days, but it's not now. It's now every day they're being judged at every, every game, which is twice a week. Um, then a manager's lifespan has gone from a three-year average where a plan can be put in place to a six-week average that you better win in the next six weeks. And I think that that has meant it's a very, very precarious industry now where uh, longer-term planning has, has really gone out the window. It might get you the job, but after that, um, that first year is survival. And the, the kind of now the, the average of an eight-month, seven, eight-month term in a job has meant that um, the pressure the manager under is, is pretty intense, but in, in very few other industries do you actually see where the, the chief exec stroke head, head coach manager of a, of a company has been, has been judged by his company and has to turn the company around in three months? Do you think we've got a... Well, there's a lot of criticism about the influx of foreign managers and head coaches into, into the Premier League especially. Are we as, as an organisation in terms of the SFA or national governing bodies, are we doing enough to, to prioritise how we can accelerate the, the development of our coaches? in order to get them in a position where they're competing with the Jurgen Klopp's et cetera for the next role? 
That's a great question because um, certainly when I came into the Scottish FA, we looked at where the gaps might be. And um, our coach education system has always been very good. It's, it's uh, our pro license is, is nearly two years to, it takes. It's not a fast track, um, and we try and put as many guest speakers in front of and the challenges to make sure that that's our degree course for, for the, the very pinnacle of, of football management is the pro license, the UEFA pro license. Um, I sit on the, the UEFA JIRA panel now, which is a technical director's um, kind of coach education panel at, in Europe, and the actual standards that they, you've got to hit for the pro license now are high, and that's, that's the way it should be. But beyond that, the CPD, obviously, that everyone has to, to, to do to keep up your licenses through Europe when you go and you, you, know, you watch a guest speaker. But there is definitely a niche that we looked at where, if you think about it, getting your driving license and then two years later being asked to drive a Formula One car, i.e. go and become a football manager, and you crash the Formula One car because you were never taught how to be a Formula One driver. And I think that's the little bit where we've, we've actually tried to to push in a variety of different experiences for the coaches. Now we've we've built something called master classes, um, so to give the coaches kind of um, I suppose that exposure to, to to best practice and top level people. For example, we brought up Dick Bate, Sean Dyche for a defending one, midfield one. We brought up Dan Fletcher, all schools, and for an attacking one, Kenny Dalglish, Henrik Larsson in the last eighteen months. But it's exposing them to to high level and and. Then on the flip side of that, business problems and business problems you've got to solve as well in terms of having uh, every bullet in your gun when it comes to being the day that they walk into that job as the manager, where on day two, they can be hit with a barrage of 10 different questions from 10 different areas and they need to answer it. So I think it's, as you're right, it's, it's, it's actually trying to arm the, the manager with as many tools as possible. And he's got to do that himself. That's where the education, but, you know, go and have a lust for education and find um, as many experiences you can from as many places you can, because you are going into an industry where it is very unforgiving. I was going to say, it's, a, it's an industry driven by results. And the, there seems to be uh, a decreasing amount of patience that owners and boards have towards their managers in terms of the results. Um, which is kind of ironic because a lot of managers talk about the attraction of the role was the project and getting involved in a project. And that implies that it's a long-term ambition that they're going to be there for a long time. Is there enough patience in football in order to allow managers to learn from mistakes and to, to learn on the job? Uh, the, the, the short answer to that is that, that no, there's not enough patience given to managers um, and managers talking about, I'm looking forward to the project. Um, is the situation when the interview comes round and the, the club sells the, the the club's strategy to a manager and the manager sells himself and his strategy to the club. Um, to allow that to happen on both sides allows patience, allows trust, um, but inherently allows it has to be results. It has to be, and it, it, you have to get results initially to allow that to eventually transpire if you want that to be the case. Or you have to have an incredibly brave, um, you know, board who are a strong board and who don't wobble to uh, social media um, attacking them on a Saturday night. And I think, I think, I think if you look at the Premier League in England at the moment, and you look at clubs, for example, that are seen as unfashionable clubs to an extent, um, and that's no disrespect to them, but Burnley, Brighton, and and Bournemouth, three clubs who who at times have been in the division below, um, but at the moment have been in the league for three or four years um, and have invariably had solid managers involved with them, but boards who have allowed the manager to manage and allowed the club to kind of run in a normal fashion. Obviously, I'm, I'm friendly with Sean, so I know, I know him really well and I know the situation at Burnley, what he's done there. Um, Eddie Howe has been allowed to, to get on with his job there. And to an extent, the, the people at Brighton have had a very good, clear, long-term plan. They're, they're good guys who understand football in this country. And, you know, recently talking to Dan Ashworth, um, who's their technical director, and, you know, Chris Hutton was in there for a period of time and allowed stability and growth. And, and they've gone, obviously, for Graham Potter now. But, you know, there needs to be that plan at a football club to allow, to allow the club to grow, but to, to stop the... Um, the, I suppose the up-down nature of how clubs can actually go. There's a famous quote from uh, Peter Drucker, who's um, a business guru, and what, one of his famous quotes is that culture eats strategy for breakfast. I, I don't know whether you agree with that or not. What are your thoughts on that? 
I do, I do, because without people, um, I think without people you have nothing. Um, I was lucky enough to go across when I was out of work to, to NFL, uh, to go into Seattle, Seattle Seahawks and, and see the environment that was created by Pete Carroll. I'd read the book, I'd watched the documentary and I managed to get in there and, and be around the club. Um, and the aura of the head coach, um, basically his tentacles were everywhere in the football club at the training ground. And, you know, the guy that was that was um, polishing the, the footballs in a room um, was was waxing lyrical about how, the, you know, the head coach spoke to him that morning and gave him so much encouragement um, that he would do anything for him. The aura around the training ground spoke volumes of what, what the man was involved with. And it goes back to the people catcher thing, I think. When you look at, at leaders and you look at, you know, who would you want to work for? Um, I think, you know, these guys are these guys are, are huge as far as that's concerned. I think, you know, we've all obviously spent time at the moment um, in our houses and people are trolling through Netflix and Amazon in terms of documentaries and anything you can get watching. And I think that there's some great ones on at the moment in terms of actually seeing how um, best practice sportsmen actually lead. And I think it's so important that, that culture... Um, that, that these people can breed um, actually makes people want to work for you and makes people want to work for organisations. If we fast forward from your, from your playing career and starting off as a manager and we take you to, to your current role with the SFA, um, one of the quotes, and I'm not sure whether this is, this is accurate, but it's a quote that I read from, from Stuart Regan. don't know whether Stuart was, was, was um, interpreted accurately on this one, but he said that the role when you replaced Brian Clare required a different style of leadership and focus. I'm not asking you to get inside of Stuart's head there and, mm -hmm. and appreciate exactly what was going on there, but what do you think made you such an outstanding candidate in terms of replacing Brian? Because obviously he came with a fantastic pedigree and decided to go in a different direction. What do you think mm -hmm. Stuart was alluding to, in, alluding to in terms of leadership then? Um, I suppose you can only ask him as far as that's concerned. What, what, what as a performance director, my role, I suppose, um, involves looking after seven national teams, so not the A squad, um, the 16s, 17s, 19s and 21s boys, 17s, 19s girls and the women's national A squad. So that comes under my remit. Um, the talent ID department, um, seven schools that we have, we have, um, we have, we train uh, elite players from clubs at 11 schools. Um, the Club Academy Scotland uh, Academy kind of criteria is, is driven by us. Our performance analysis, our sports science and medicine, and then the elite coaching education department that I spoke to you about. So all of those um, umbrella under myself, and really, it's a. You then have to also realise that you're dealing with clubs, corporate governance, budgets, boardrooms, and and you know eventually strategy and culture. Um, I suppose one of the big things going into Scotland, realising the 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 nature of Scottish people, um, we can be belligerent people. And I think going up there, you don't go up there and tell anybody to do anything because you get short shrift. And I think there was a way, there's a way of communication, realizing that we're not sitting in an ivory tower. We are um, sitting alongside clubs trying to help because we're both wanting the, the player to be to be good. You know, we want their players to be fabulous so that they become good Scotland players, and they want them to be fabulous for for reasons for themselves. So, I think it was a case of. Um, going in and, and communicating on a regular basis with people at, at clubs, um, trying to show best practice from, from maybe from where I've come from and, and what, I've, what I've experienced in, in the football career, but doing it in a way, again, where you're not telling people. So, for example, bringing a group of uh, you know, coaches together, showing them best practice, putting it up on screen, um, leaving the book sitting in front of them saying, thanks for coming. And when you leave, they take the book and they go. And I think it's a it's a very softly, softly approach that you don't tell them what to do in Scotland. But what you do is you you show best practice and see this is what this is what, what could work, and this is what maybe will help us because we've got to get closer to our European counterparts in terms of how our players play football. And that's certainly one of the things that I keep driving at in terms of our coaches, education for our coaches, but also education for our players. Technically, kids in Scotland are getting better. They are getting better in England as well, obviously, but there are more and more in the last 10 years, 3G pitches. And technically, all our coaches want to work on technique now. So we are getting better technically. <clears throat> where we have to get better is tactically. And that's where we've got to impart that in our young players. They've got to tactically get better. 
to compete with their European counterparts at youth level. And I am seeing that over the last couple of years, our results we've taken um, our training camps out to Spain now, to an area of Spain where the Spanish national youth teams go and the English national team go there as well, a place called Pinata and near Alicante. And all our national youth team games, warm-up games for the UEFA games go there now. And um, we play regularly against best in Europe in friendlies. And that's where you actually start to see growth um, and a mindset of we can actually compete at that level. And we've got to expose them to that before they then then go and jump into professional football. If you if, if we were to talk to some of your colleagues at the SFA or the clubs that you work with or former players and people that you come up against in, in games and stuff as a, as a player, what, what would they say defines Malky Mackay in terms of leadership or in terms of your values? What, what would be the non-negotiables, the things that you're not prepared to compromise on? Um, I suppose work ethic's always been there. I don't think I was ever the most talented footballer, to be honest with you. So I think what I did was I tried to work hard. I think maybe coming from the background I did, which was part-time football, um, there's always that aspect that you're not quite as good as, as the others. So work harder. Um, and it's what I want my staff to be obsessive about football because I've been like that. And I, I want the staff around about me to be like that, I suppose. Um, and have a work ethic, a, a desperate work ethic to, to do as well as you can. And, and a hunger to actually learn from as many people as I can. After that, I probably don't want to hear what the, my staff have got to say. As far as <laughs> what have been the things in your current role that have surprised you, which have been a challenge that you didn't expect, which weren't as part of the job description or as part of the conversations that you're having with Stuart and the, uh, the executive? I think uh, in Scotland, there's always going to be a struggle funding-wise. Uh, there is not the ability to have the same tap into media funding uh, that, that England has. And I think that's always been a struggle. We need to rely on gates through the through the turnstile in Scotland um, and whatever media contract they can and the national team qualifying for tournaments, which which obviously makes a difference in terms of prize money. And I think uh, with the fact that it's been 20 years since that's happened, um, that leaves a big struggle for, for uh, certainly for everyone really, but certainly as far as the association is concerned and the projects that we can actually put in place and the help we can give clubs um, and I'm constantly going on to the staff about necessity as the mother of invention and keep trying to wring the sponge and, and be, work as efficiently as we can. Um, but at the same time, surprises, I'll tell you what, surprise has been the fact that um, watching clubs work together, that's been a huge surprise. We, we started something called Pride Labs, which was a, a, a new scenario where clubs, coaches, you know, the, the 19, 20 clubs that are involved in the academies, uh, hired full-time members of staff, heads of children's, heads of youth, heads of goalkeeping underneath the head of academy, just like the EPPP does in England. And we decided to get them all together in workshops four times a year um, and put them in rooms. So 19 heads of academy together, 19 heads of youth, 19 heads of goalkeeping. And from day one where they were all covering their work and not sharing anything to eight visits later where they all realised that they were all doing the same job and they all had the same challenges and they all had the same frustrations and they were the only people that could help each other along with us. We ended up becoming facilitators rather than actually mentors. And I think it's been a fabulous thing to see young coaches at clubs across the country helping each other and going for coffee with each other and discussing their similar problems. And it's been a kind of byproduct of this. It's something that's come out of it that's, that's made me so proud of them and, and surprised that, that when you get a right, the correct environment, then you do get people wanting to work because, again, Scots people desperately care about football. They love it and they're passionate about it. And it's given them a vehicle to actually go and, um, go and you know, explain that. You, you mentioned resilience earlier on, Malky, in the, in, the, in the conversation. And I'm thinking about where resilience appears within in the academies. Do, do academies, professional football academies, have a tough job in, in terms of working al alongside families and supporting them in, in building this resilience in their kids? I think huge. It's a huge problem. You, you've got situations where the coach of the team has got a, a, a precocious talent in the team um, that the academy are desperate to keep, um, but he's got to have standards and, and uh, rules and regulations for that team. And um, you know how does he bend that for one player? Um, so that you've got problems as far as that. And nowadays, where there's a lot of parents who have got a lot are a lot more vocal and have got a lot more to say um, in terms of how clubs um, look after their children, some rightly, some wrongly. 
Um, so you've got a lot of stresses on coaches in terms of, and you've got some coaches now who bring, bizarrely enough, bring, if they go to speak to a, a parent, bring either HR with them or a lawyer. Uh, one club I know brought a lawyer into the room to talk to a, a parent about the, the child. So you've got, you've got certainly pressures on academies to actually produce players because obviously the top line is that they want, you know, clubs want to see a return on their money, but it's an eventual return. And I don't think until an academy product is sold by a club, whether that be at 16 or whether that be the guy gets into the first team and sold for millions. I think that's when academies breathe a little easier when they see that the, the work they're doing is, the, the, the bosses that the work they're doing is paying off. But as far as the, the problems that they've got to deal with in terms of how they transition these kids and give them resilience, as I said to you earlier on, Darren Fletcher and Paul Scholes were up and they talked about Eric Harrison and the resilience that he gave. They hated some of the sessions that he was involved in. They hated, for weeks on end, they hated them, the, the way that he, he, he talked to them. And, but underneath, they knew that he was trying to do the best for them because he was giving them this, um, the, the step between being an academy product and actually going into the real world, the big bad world of being involved in football and how you handle um, the next 15 years of a career. Um, was shorter because of because of these coaches, and I think that's a it's a tough ask for academies. Professional sport, I think, across the board is a really turbulent industry. It doesn't matter whether you're involved in athletics or whether you're involved in <clears throat> professional football. What one of the things that seems to be a key in the literature is the importance of a really really strong support network, family and friends, that kind of thing. From your own perspective, how do you manage the, the work life balance and the pressures that you're under and stuff? I am probably my wife would say not not very well at times. Um, I think the fact that you're um, in terms of being a football or if you're a player with a wife and children, um, a contract. Maybe people know this, maybe they don't. A contract means a contract. So a four year deal at Norwich for me means they cannot get rid of me in that four years, and we can put down roots there and live there if we want. They might not play me, but they could they could have me there. Once you become a manager, um, a four-year contract means uh, the termination contract. So it could be six, nine months. They could actually just pay you up there and then six months and you're off and, and within the space of a few months. Um, usually managers at that point have got older children uh, who are then in high schools. And at that point, to actually move around the country and the, the job, the, this precarious job, um, isn't viable. So that being the case, they end up staying away from home. Um, the nature of the job and the all-encompassing way that it, it actually, feel, you know, I suppose gets to you means that you're actually away from family for a long period of time. When you are at home, the phone's not stopping. Um, and it is a difficult challenge because there, there's no easy answer. You know, the family can't uproot four, five, six times in six years to come to, you know, where you're earning money for them around the country. And the fact that this precarious nature of it, meaning that it, it's so short term, why would you do that anyway? Um, so that's a that's a thing that, that managers have got to handle somehow. And um, even you know, for myself, the last couple of years in this job, um, you know, I'm, I'm the commute to, to London from Edinburgh um, regularly or not as regularly as it should be um, to see your family is something you've got to deal with. Um, so it is a situation where you, you've got to try and prioritise. You've got to be very um, organised in terms of how your diary looks. Um, and when you do go home, have the discipline to try and stay off your phone e or emails, even although there's a, you know at least one thing a day where you're going to have to deal with. Certainly, as far as I was concerned, being out of work is another um, aspect to football management where the mental health side of it really challenges you. Uh, I was out of work for a year and a half, and there's, there's plenty of coaches and managers nowadays. There is, there is only 92 jobs. There's 60 million people in, you know, in England, and there was 92 managers jobs so there's an awful lot of managers that are out of work and coaches that are out of work at, at various times and how do they handle that and I think that's a really it's a really important point that I know that you guys on the course actually deal with um but to actually you know what, how do you fill your day do you, do you have a focus to it and mine is to get up in the morning take the kids to school go to the gym and then after that what how can I fill my day you know because after a couple of weeks the phone stops ringing and, and as good as people are, the phone stops ringing and people get back to their way of life again. So I, I just decided to go and try and find as many people throughout Britain, Europe and the world that I could go and see in a variety of different fields to try and educate myself for the next time that I tried to get a job again. So I think that's what a lot of them, a lot of people do that. A lot of people try and do that. And it's, but it's, it's a very uh, interesting aspect of, of 
resilience and strength. You mentioned before about academy directors working with precocious talents and parents banging on the academy director's door saying my kid should be in the first team or not getting enough opportunities and stuff. When those prickly kids become prickly adults, how do you, how do you deal with them when they're in the change room? Because you must have come across a few. Yeah, without a doubt. Invariably, the ones that the the what I say to the young coaches in terms of who are struggling with players like that, um, if they get to a point where they cross the line, um, they go, and your academy director should back you on it. They go unless they're they're Lionel Messi, and there's very few of them, because at the next club they'll do the exact same thing, and the next club they'll do the same thing, and kids like that that, that certainly. Um, don't have that work ethic or they don't end up becoming footballers anyway. There is so few that become footballers nowadays and, um, for, to get into that manager's team. But when you're talking about adults that are, let's call it high maintenance players or X-factor players, the balance between what the X-factor gives the team versus um, the, the problems they cause for the organisation is the balance that the, the, the head coach has to weigh up. Every player is not treated the same and that's just life. Um, you know, but what do they give the team? I remember at Norwich City, um, we had a guy, Darren Huckerby, who Tony will remember from, from Man City days, who was, um, you know, maybe in the fringes of the Man City team, but he was by far one of the best players in the championship when he came on loan to us. Um, the Darren, um, the left back at times, uh, had to get binoculars out to see Darren because uh, how little he actually helped him. But you got the ball to Darren in the opposition half and he would win a game for you. And we had, so we had the and he was a terrific guy as well. So we had the balance between uh, the X factor nature of him versus how you know how little he did defending wise for the team. So we compensated for that. Going through behavioural aspects, then that that becomes something else to say how behaviour is breached. And if if a club have got, we played a club. I remember in the front three um, would not run five yards. All very talented individuals, but they wouldn't run five yards. And we played against them and. Um, I looked at that situation at that club and I said, if he keeps playing the three of them, they'll be gone soon. And he was. And it was a Premier League club. And the balance between what that player gives you and doesn't give you. I had Craig Bellamy early in my career and late in my career. Um, as a 19-year-old, he was at Norwich as a young, precocious talent coming through and caused absolute murders to the point where we, we ended up locking him in the, the, the toilet and the bus for four hours and the bus journey from Norwich to, to Birmingham one day uh, until he signed a bit of paper saying he was going to stop being cheeky to the players. Um, but at the same time, what a fabulous young talent and a professional and desperately love football and what a career he had. At the very tail end of his career when he came back to Cardiff City um, and still um, belligerent and still mouthy and still but demanding standards on the pitch, which was which his training was was um, was never in question. Um, but all the other things that went with Craig were still there. Um, and but we sat down, and maybe because I'd known him for a long time, and um, and he had he had you know various situations going on in his life at that point. We sat down and we talked about um, the fact that you weren't in a, you're not in a dog eat dog world anymore, Craig. You're one of the top talents here. There's kids here that are looking up to you. The career you've had, you need to mentor these kids. If you're going to be a coach, I want to be a coach. Well, you're going to have to actually talk differently to them to get them to to listen to you and trust you. And it was a huge mindset change and a light bulb moment for him that he actually had to talk to young kids and give them advice rather than, than, than hammering them. So I think again, it's, it goes, Ian, it goes back to personality, how you actually deal with people and handle people, I think, but but it can be an issue for managers all over the country, as to, especially nowadays, you know, you look at, most people are watching The Last Dance, you know, at the moment with the Michael Jordan thing. Well, Pippen decided not to come back on the, the, the court with five seconds to go. Jackson had to handle that. Rodman decided to go to WWE instead of um, instead of actually, you know, going to his bed that night to rest up for the playoffs the following day. And Jordan was was as high maintenance as they come. And Phil Jackson had to juggle all that. Never treat everyone like they treated Steve Kerr, uh, the kind of model pro, and somehow managed to to you know tread the thin line where he still got everybody on board and he still has a culture versus. Um, something that actually causes anarchy. Is that, you just mentioned uh, the Michael Jordan documentary, which I think most of us have seen at the moment, and still go. I'm still going through my box set on it. It was interesting how Phil Jackson handled uh, Dennis Rodman, as you say, allowing him to go to Vegas. 
Is it a case that we, we put too much pressure on young managers? Because certainly in the case of Phil Jackson and a lot of other uh, high-profile coaches, they seem to really get into their pomp, into their really hit their stride once they get into their 40s and 50s, maybe into their early 60s and stuff. Is, is there a case for us revisiting coach education in terms of allowing those coaches to evolve? Again, it's about uh, clubs allowing a manager time, I suppose. I don't... I don't suppose I, I, I look at Brendan, who was a young coach in 80, who were young coaches and really in touch with players uh, and had, had good success in their, their mid-30s. I think what you've got is inquisitive people. And I think if you put best practice in front of them and you put, um, I think if you put guys like Phil Jackson in terms of the, the documentary, his books, his teachings, um, leaders, put them in front of, your, of people. I think the correct people will learn from. I don't think it matters what age you are. I think young coaches... Um, you know, you just you stick best practice in front of people, and then you and you say that's that's how we we sh we, we we look as if we should act as far as that's concerned. Um, you know, there, there's there's a lot of them. We talked to you know about about who inspires you. You know, I talked to uh, recently. I did a, a thing. Um, I was on the Brazilian pro license. I, I asked to, sorry, I was asked to go down and speak on the Brazilian pro license, and one of the, the topics was who inspires you in football and outside of football and. I actually put the, the slide up, the Bobby Robson documentary, more than a manager. And I mean, any, I, I defy anyone to watch that and not be inspired by him in terms of being involved in football. And I think how people handle people, I think it, you, you educate and you learn from these people. Um, outside football, recently there was a fabulous YouTube um, clip recently on, on a guy called Admiral William McRaven. Um, who who did a, a, a speech to the University of Texas on a, a graduation night and spoke about, about values and he's got a book out called Make Your Bed and, and I would urge anybody to go and watch it. My God, that inspires you. Um, I think how people handle people is a huge thing and I think you can learn massively from that. Final question for you, Malcolm, before we go to Tim because I think Tim's got some questions as well. Is yeah. that I think people's personality and what they're really about often gets revealed when they're in the middle of a crisis. And obviously we're going through a pandemic at the moment. Mm -hmm. Who are the people that have stuck out for you in sport, outside of sport, that have really kind of enhanced their reputation as being leaders? Um, again, just just by, by looking at it, I was fortunate enough. I took my team into the, the Special Forces, the SES in Hereford. I took the Cardiff team in there and we had a day with them. We spent a day with them discussing leadership and teamwork. Um, and I was invited back by them to talk on crisis management and sport. And by that time, I had plenty of crisis management going on in sport. So, um, you know, being there with them and seeing, seeing basically best practice that actually, if, if they don't do it, if they don't do what the guy next to them talk says, you know, it's, it's, it's not just, you're not just losing a game. And I think one of the things they, they had a huge, I said, how do you actually pick these people? And obviously recently there's been the celebrity SES and they're showing you bits and pieces, but um, I said, is it the the kind of the mountains in Hereford, you know, the mountains in Brecon Beacons? Is that what he said? No, no, that's where we get rid of the toy soldiers. We then throw the rest into the jungles of Borneo and we film them. And he said, and we film them together in small, tight units, having to work with each other. And he said, they're wet constantly because it's raining. It's high humidity. We don't give them much to eat. And we give them tasks to do. We film them. And he said, and you see where personalities can't handle each other and, and can't get on with each other. Um, and that's where we then deselect all those those different types of people. Um, and I thought, that, I thought that was an incredibly interesting thing and thought that's something to actually think about how you bring people together. Um, I think I, I, another one I, I look at and I urge people to look at, Colin Powell, the ex-joint chief of staff in America, um, has got a fabulous 17-point PowerPoint on leadership on the on the internet and um, it encapsulates everything you would want in a, in a leader and want to be in a leader if anybody gets their hands on it. Um, again, just, I think, going out and learning as much as you can about people and taking little bits from as many as you can, surely has got to help. Great, Malky. Really appreciate it. Lots of food for thought there. I'll, I'll pass over to Tim who thinks he's got some questions for you as well. Sure. Yeah, brilliant. Thanks, Ian. Um, just follow on that. It's, it's an interesting one, isn't it? How we, we pick up our leadership stands... Um, really stands out. We get to, we we in in this particular time of crisis. Now I'm just thinking about Adam Silver, um, chief executive of the NBA, and what what happened in, as a contingency plan in preparation for this. 
and what what could have led on and you think about a leader having a foresight and making a decision informed decision but yeah. correctly making you know signing people off two weeks before so they can get used to this to get it in, in preparation for it and you're thinking wouldn't it be interesting if we'd had the foresight in in our politics in our politics and various other things um that, that's cracking on at, at the minute and you think if we had a little bit more of that you know what we could learn from those interesting one of the questions that's come up is um peter's asked in the role of a sporting director is it viewed less suspiciously now as the younger breed are coming through? And will the, will the role of sporting director become more important than the manager in clubs? I think it's a bit of a prickly question, but the first part of it is certainly uh, debatable. No, it's definitely coming in more and more. And I think um, I think the sporting director role is a, it's a fascinating one at football clubs. And, and I know I've been, I've been speaking to Tony and, and, and Andy on this for, for years, I think, from, from a long time ago. Um, who, who goes in first? Is it the sporting director that's hired the manager? Well, if that's the case, or the head coach, that, if that's the case, then there's a clear line of sight there. Um, if the manager is in before the sporting director comes in, you, you could have an issue unless, unless a, an immediate relationship is, is formed there. Um, who buys the players? Who is the line manager of who? I think these are all issues that have to be cleared up pretty quickly. In terms of that, is there an insecurity that the manager? I don't think nowadays the manager feels that the sporting director is going to take his job, but I definitely think that the manager there is a there is an insecurity there uh, that that he, the, the sporting director might want to bring his man in. Um, I, but I think it's been something that's been on, in in Europe for years in terms of the sporting director and the head coach and how that relationship works. For example, recently the the Borussia Dortmund documentary it's on just now is fabulous, but you've got the the sporting director Michael Zork sits on the bench next to the manager. And is there is is um, the the guy that the manager turns to an awful lot. Um, so I think in in Britain it's it's certainly coming in more and more that there is there are different facets to it. I mean, back in the day, the the academy manager now sits a, apart from the manager. It used to be that the manager left, the whole staff crumbled because he took everyone with him, and clubs were seeing whole academies falling. And now I think you've got that head of academy where he reports into a technical board at the club and doesn't really report into the manager any longer. We are going the same way, but certainly from my own point of view, my first job at Watford, there was a chief executive, there was the head sporting director and there was me. And we met every Wednesday, the three of us. And the chief exec's job was to sell the football club at that point. The sporting director's job was to bring two million pounds in in player sales every year. And my job was to keep us in a division on the public's budget. Now those three circles don't meet or shouldn't meet, but relationships meant that if we trusted and opened ourselves up to each other every every week. We would meet and get it all at the table. There would be fights, there'd be arguments, but we were all trying to do the right thing for the club. As far as transfers are concerned, and who brings brings players in, um, the manager nowadays has got so many games to to be involved in. You don't get time to go and watch games because you're playing in the same time as others. You very rarely get time to go and watch a player three or four times. So there has to be a department in a football club that actually looks after talent ID and player development because as Wenger says, I'm a good manager because I've got good players. If you don't get good players in the door, you've got a problem. So you, there has to be an element of trust that he may bring you, certainly in my case, they brought you five for this position. Uh, these are the five that we can afford, that we could get, we think we could get. It's up to you now to actually go and tell me which one of the five you want to get and I'll try. Um, so I think there's a lot of different aspects to it. So just just picking up on what you just said there, is that how you envisage? I mean, you're you're in you're in the role, and you've had experience of that. Is that how you envisage the role um, kind of evolving going forward into into uh, like the the British football in particular, sitting alongside the manager, um, working in between the board and, and and helping with those decisions? It's certainly the way that a lot of a lot of clubs are going. Um, that there is this clear line that there needs to be. There needs to be a, an open communication there. There needs to be right away, here's what I expect of you and here's what you can expect of me. So that there's, a, there's a clear line of sight there as to, as to who's the line manager, uh, who feeds into who and where the communication aspects go. And I think, I think if that is defined quickly and early, um, and then it's down to personalities. D does the manager b draw the sporting director in? Does he feel as if he can? Does he feel trust? Or does he feel as if everything he says to the sporting director is going to go straight back to the owner? And does the sporting director feel the manager is buying into the club and the model and the financial aspect to his problems? Um, but at the end of the day, for it to work, invariably those, those relationships have to be reasonably solid.
Okay, brilliant. Uh, great answer. I'm just going to pass you over to Tony. Um, who's got a couple of questions have been texted in by uh, some of our delegates are, are on uh, YouTube. Malky, a couple of interesting questions here. One from AD. He just says, AD, former player. So I'm not, <laughs> sure, not so sure who that is. Um, he says, um, did working prior to going into Celtic help you prepare in any way? And then the second part of the question is, what lessons from playing have you taken into being a leader across your life? Oh, OK. Um, yes, I suppose. I think going in and working for five years in a bank from 16 to 21 gave me a little sense of maturity of having to deal with adults every day in life in, in a city centre bank in Glasgow and actually work with 100 people who worked in a big bank. Um, which meant I went into Celtic slightly with a different view on life um, from maybe some of the young lads that had been in a bubble since they were kind of 16 and been involved in football. It certainly helped as far as that's concerned and maybe my a little bit in terms of maturity, Tony. Um, as far as the, the kind of aspects of the, the job, I think that sense of... Because nowadays... nowadays with the, the, the amount of influx of foreign players into the UK, then, then careers have shortened in terms of what, what a British player used to have a 15-year playing career. Um, sometimes as a professional now shrinks to five or six because there's such an influx of, of players coming into the country. Um, but to actually be a player for that length of time, I suppose when I look at players, um, I see sacrifice and I see, I see work ethic. I, I love when I see professionals that are really good pros um, and it's a word that that kind of, um, you know, when you say is he a really good pro, I don't, I'm not sure people quite get what that means. For example, Ashley Young was with me at Watford as a young kid, and recently they're obviously playing reruns, and they showed the Watford Leeds playoff final recently, which I played in, and Ashley was a young 19 year old in it. Um, and then I turned over, and and on the other the other channel, it was Inter Milan versus Fiorentina live at that point. It was about six eight weeks ago, and. Um, Ashley was playing wing for Inter Milan and I dropped him a text after it and I've used his name a few times because four managers after Fergie left Man United who bought him um, Ashley Young who is seen as a fringe English player around about Man United the last four or five years four managers made him captain of the team and, and he was still there half a billion pounds later Ashley Young who's seen as a fringe player was still in the Man United leading the team out so that means one thing. That means he was a top, top professional. And you look at the likes of James Milner and J Jordan Henderson, who, among a team of stars, are two English players who are actually pro probably up the front of training every day, leading the dressing room, you know, having body fats at their age, you know, that, that they shouldn't have, normal people shouldn't have. And what you see is sacrifice. And that's, I suppose, the big thing I see, that, that work ethic and discipline to get up every day in life um, and just, just work as hard as they can and make sure their body's as good as they can to go out and be at, at that level for so long. And I think that spills over into, into life as well in terms of how they actually act. Great answer, Jed, for that, Mark. You've got a, a second question here from Marco. Marco from London. He said he's played against you, but he doesn't give me his second name, actually. He says... Um, got any bruises? Say that again? Got any bruises? <laughs> hey, you or him? <laughs> Both of you. Uh, he says, uh, what skills, and he says here, uh, human skills are required to be the PM. PM is quite uh, appropriate at this moment in time. I'm th I think he's talking about the performance manager at the Scottish FA. Um, I think the fact that you have to be... Um, you have to have you know, communi communication skills and you've got to be collaborative. You have to see people's point of view. Um, we're a governing body and we're a regulator. And with that, you know, it's always going to bring um, issues and it's always going to bring criticism. And there's, there's never enough money to go around. Um, I think you've got to see clubs' point of view. I think you've got to obviously see your own standards point of view in terms of best practice and the regulations and you've also got to be brave enough to to show where we are in relation to others so for example where we are in relation in youth football to european football and actually be at times brave enough to actually show it and say we're not where we should be and we need to get better and it'll take us all 
but um, where we are at the moment is not good enough and, and strive to be better. Malky, I really appreciate your time today. Um, I appreciate how honest you've been and how forthright you've been with, with your answers. It's been a great insight for those on the platform that are listening to us. And there are, there are plenty that have, have tuned in today. Um, so from a VSI perspective, from myself and Andy, really appreciate your time. And hopefully we'll be in a position where we can uh, meet up soon and, and chew the fat as we do in more detail. Um, Ian, as always, thanks for, for facilitating the session. And at this point, I'm going to hand you over to Piero, who will uh, who will close up this this, uh, this afternoon's webinar. Thanks, Malky. Thanks, guys. Thank you. You bet. If I turn myself off mute, there we go. Uh, no, just a, a big thank you um, to, to Ian and, and Malky for today's interview. It was a really interesting discussion and, and, and lots of takeaways from the session. So on behalf of, of Sport Trees Agency, thank you for everyone for joining us today and for the, the thought-provoking questions here at the end as well. And obviously, Malky, Ian, thanks once again for your time. It's uh, very much appreciated. Thanks, Piero. Thank thanks, you. Thanks, guys. Cheers, Cheers guys. Malky. Cheers, guys.